history of Southwest Washington and uh, especially the Lonely River. Um, who else? And Tucker, you've met. And uh, Kathleen Davies is not here. Uh, she was a member of the group that originally got together and uh, looked out about how we're going to talk about history. And, uh, and, and um, Jim Sace. And Jim Sace probably is the, the key person because years ago, Jim called me on the phone out of the blue and said, Sydney, when you're gone, who's going to tell the stories? <laughs> And uh, you know that really changed my life a little bit. And uh, I don't know if Jim's still telling stories, but I still am. And uh, I, 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 I want to encourage everybody to tell stories. So we got together and thought, how, you know, how can we keep this going? We all get questions from community people all the time about our history, especially since genealogy has become such a biggie. And uh, people find out, oh, you know, I had a grandfather who lived in uh, Long Beach or wherever, and uh, what can I find out? So people are interested in what Long Beach was like in his grandfather's day or whatever. So that's, that's how this started. We decided that we would call it a history forum. This morning when I was brushing my teeth, forum. I thought, I wonder if forum is the right word. <laughs> so I looked it up. It is. <laughs> I want to tell you, a place, meeting, or medium, as in newspapers, I mean, where ideas and views on a particular issue can be exchanged. And that's what we want to do. Uh, yeah. our, our particular issue is history of Southwest Washington. So today, and so it's all a huge experiment and uh, you're part of it, and so I hope that you uh, jump in with both feet when it's time for you to jump in. We're going to start with uh, our three illustrious speakers. We're so lucky to have them, and um, uh, I've given them each 10 minutes to talk about their ancestry and how they got here, and um, give us a little bit of a picture about how it might have been back in the day when their ancestors came here before settlement, before white settlement. And um, then we will open it up to questions, comments, um, other, other uh, historic uh, concerns, and uh, you can direct your questions to any of the speakers or to one another or whatever. We'll just see how it goes. Uh, it's a forum, and uh, and it has no form. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I would like to introduce the three speakers first, and then they'll just one after another give their their presentation. First is Charlotte. It will be Charlotte Chalene, and uh, Charlotte uh, divides her time between Seattle and Ocean Park. And she uh, has the George Johnson House bed and breakfast there. Some of you may know that. And if you don't know it, you, you should. It's fabulous. <laughs> and uh, and speaks, of, speaks of her heritage. Fabulous. OK. Uh, and then we have Charles Fum, who lives in Centralia. And uh, grew up in. I mean, Chehalis. <laughs> oh, well, Chehalis. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, grew up in South, South Bend, right? Um, and uh, has long, long roots here um, on, on, uh, on the coast. Um, and is a well-known artist, as many of you know, and he has brought some of his, one of his projects here to share with you, I think. And, uh, oh, and I asked Mary, uh, Charles's wife. How long have you lived in Chehalis? <laughs> <laughs> well, we went there temporarily. We've been there 50 some years. Yeah, we went there temporarily and they've been there 55 years. Or so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a while. And then Linda LeClaire, who lives in Clipson, who grew up here on the peninsula. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, you may know 
Linda, because she uh, often is uh, around and about at events like this. <coughs> Excuse me, although there are events quite like this. <laughs> with, with her uh, sister, she has three sisters, and uh, they're all uh, most interesting characters. <laughs> and, and, um, so that's another forum. <laughs> anyway, we welcome you very much, and thank you so much for agreeing to start us off, because none of us know really how it's going to go or what's going to happen, and uh, so that's it. So Charlotte, are you willing to be the first up? <laughs> right. When Sydney calls, you jump up, and you, <laughs> and you, <laughs> and you arrive, <laughs> and we don't really know what is going to happen. But this is going to be very chaotic, and there's no regular continuity with what I have, but my great aunt, the Colberts, if you know the Colbert House in El Waco, um, she was a teacher all her life, and she first found cut and paste before there were computers. So that I have a lot of information. I've tried to just dog ear a few things to just say about um, trying to say what the confluence of white versus the Indian uh, was all about. I'll just sort of read little snippets. Um, if Native Americans recorded their tribal genealogy, they would have known about the Chinook Bride of Alexi Obishan, Hudson's Bay Trapper, Voyager, Traveler of the Wilderness. Slow down, slow down. Can't hear you. Whose oh, descendants so helped to make history in this part of the world? Um, he and his brother were trying to avoid conscription with Napoleon in, in uh, France, so they came over to Quebec and they joined with Lord Selkirk in 1811 with the Hudson's Bay as part of a plan of fostering westward expedition and settlement. Somebody should have told him that might have worked out so well. Um, he married Al Mox, Marianne, and I've got a cousin here who we've got conflicting comments about, you know, where that all fit in, but Marianne was quite instrumental. Um, the Hudson Bay Company also did not allow their employees to bring wives west with them, but they had nothing against them marrying Indians on the coast. Um, when they retired from the Hudson Bay duties, the loyal employees in the Columbia District, like Obishan, decided to retire the hardships of the trail and the company, and they encouraged them to settle in French Prairie in Marion County, Oregon. So there's a lot of relatives there. Uh, there's even a boat stop on the Willamette known as the Odishan Landing. Um, and she had asked me to kind of what they did back then, and um, part of it was making grist mills in the French Prairie when it was first colonized. And Amelia's husband also built grist mills that she accompanied him in 1847 uh, to build one for Captain John Sutter in California. When they were down there, because that was right at the gold rush time, they actually had a claim, but they decided to leave California, got on a boat with their gold, and who knows how much they came back with them, and came up to Columbia and homesteaded with Obishan in French Prairie, and then decided to move to Portland, taking another piece of land where the Union Station now stands. He engaged in cutting slab wood for steamers to burn, but the property where the family was living was near a marsh, and their, Catherine, their daughter, Catherine, got malaria. And a doctor had advised them to move to the coast. Yeah, where the warm coast. <laughs> yeah. Go west to the wind and the rain. Um, anyway, they came down on a slough, packed with all of their belongings to stock a store, and <laughs> They were hunters and gatherers, they were not sailors. It took them a month to get down the Columbia River, and they couldn't get around Ellis Point, or Point Ellis, and they had to walk over past Fort Columbia to have somebody help them in Chinookville to get their boat around. But they eventually made it, I think it said, that one of the articles said that it took them a month to get down the river. Um, anyway, they had set up a store in Chinookville, and then saw how profitable the fishing was, and they set up uh, fishing as their livelihood at that point. I actually still have cousins here who are active oystermen in the bay, so it's been part of the family forever. Um, they found in Chinookville, and I found it interesting, let's see if I can find it, I'm sorry, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. My Aunt Mitty and Mildred Colbert 
I could tell because of her handwriting. She did a little diagram of what Chinookville looked like back in the 1800s. And it's got Point Ellis here and Scarborough Head up here. And then it says, um, and it's got all of the property and they were all lots of 50 by 100. And then there's this dotted line that goes through here. And the, the, the final thing is, all beyond dotted line washed away. So, <laughs> so I guess there's no reclaiming property of an oyster bill. Let's see. Uh, while they were in Chinookville, they found that with the children that they needed education. And my family has always been full of educators and teachers. And they actually tore their home down piece by piece and brought it to El Waco, where they built it's on Quaker Street in between the lake and the main drag. I think the main drag is there. Um, and currently it is used only for for storage. Uh, it was donated to the State Park Department. So if you go through El Waco, uh, you'll see this old Victorian home. It's, the newsletter came out in the uh, County Historical Survey this last year about 150 years of the Colbert House. And Aaron, who is the head guy at uh, Cape Disappointment, is always kind to my family. And whenever we have that first salmon, we've got a lot of relatives that come down. He allows us to go in there because it's just completely closed off. And it's really sad because there's furniture that I remember. There's like old Hudson Bay, you know, uh, chairs with, uh, you know, deer skin holding them together. And, and it's just all empty and covered in piles and corners. And it's just a sad house. But it's my family's house, but I can't do anything with it. And I don't think the park department actually wants to do anything. And they're trying to sell it. And it's but I do remember being in the house as a kid. It was always a place that we would come down to, and all of the adults would be in the parlor, and my bedroom was right up above, and it was like a vent to get heat. And I would sneak over, and I'm sure that there was some board that made a little creak. And all of a sudden, all of this conversation would instantly turn to French. <laughs> so I gave up on that. I knew I wasn't going to hear, hear anything that was going on down there. Um, so let's see. Uh, we got that. Um, there's an interesting uh, comment in here. My, my aunt was trying to put together sort of information about the Chinook, Chinook clothes and, and so forth. And they had one on birds that I thought was kind of fun. Um, they tied strings to sticks and hid the long grass. And they had these big frames that they put into the mud flaps. And then when enough birds would get in there, they put some food to entice the birds. They pull the sticks out and then they get their, their birds captured in these frames. What's interesting is that as my uh, bed and breakfast, I've got a nonprofit group that comes down to, they're all scientists doing surveys of the peregrines and eagles on the coast. And they have a system to capture the birds the same way. It's like this big net that goes out and captures them. So I guess things don't change very much of the time. Um, there's also a section in here about nets and how they would take hemlock strips. And then this is one of the sinkers. You could see the groove around the center that they would use to drop the nets down. And then they said that they had like a, almost like a canoe that would act as the buoy to bring it back up again. Um, and games. She has a whole section on games. That the women had a gambling game that they used with beaver teeth. And they had little markers on them that were the same thing as dice. So nothing really changes. We've got the other casinos here back there. This was one that I, I enjoyed. Uh, this was written by my grandmother. And it said, grandmother, so uh, it was with a party which named the Siskiyou Mountains. I mean, Grandmother Obershaw. On their trip down to California from Oregon, on their Hudson's Bay hunting trips, one of the men had a bobtailed horse. The Indians had heard the French refer to the bobtailed horse as sans cue. Sans, of course, in French means without, and cue means tail. The two words Slow came down. together. Slow down. <laughs> I'm not nervous. <laughs> so the two words came together, and they sound like siskiyou. And the jargon spoken by the Indians added that word to their vocabulary. Uh, clothes, we didn't wear feathers in our hair. The feathers were also used as padding because you could put it in an enclosed encasement of 
of Thule and it could make a, a mattress. And because of the climate down here, we, don't, we didn't do totem poles, we didn't do uh, a lot of regalia that could still be found. There are baskets, but, but artifacts from Chinooks are far and few between. Um, but my mother made button blankets. The button blankets came from the Russians brought over the Russian trade beads, the Russian blues, and the materials. And then the Sandwich Islands, they would have brought up for the sailing ships for trading for furs. They would bring up the button blankets, set up their buttons, and then they would put totem designs on them. My mother made them until she passed away. She, when she was still working on them, she was like 98. And they're all done by hand, and at various times in, in family gatherings, um, we would all get together. This is hard to see for you, but this was a ceremony where all of our family had their button blankets on. Oh. And we had our backs to the camera so that you could see them. But it wasn't Chinook, so when people look at it and go, well, that's a nice Indian design, it's Alaskan, but yet we didn't have, we don't have the cedar bark capes or ermine or uh, furs to be able to display our, our family traditions. And we didn't do, like I said, we didn't do totems or things that really lasted through the weather down here. Um, the Chinooks were also known as real ambassadors, and I find it really interesting because their, their language was a language of a jargon, because they were the first to greet the whites into the area, and they had to communicate somehow, and the Chinook jargon goes all up and down the coast. I mean, I go to Seattle, it's like Alki, and you know, it's like everywhere around. But I think that it's, it was really interesting that of Alexei Obishaw and Alpha Mox, direct descendants, two of them from this tribe are United States ambassadors. And there have been only three indigenous people that have been ambassadors. One of them, of course, was Chris Stevens, who was the ambassador to Libya, who was killed in Benghazi. And now there is a current one who is related to Joseph Petit and the sons in the Waco, if you know the son's name. And his name is Joe Nysun, and he is currently the temp he's being voted on to be the ambassador to Barbados. So he's down someplace in the tropics with a little, you know, <laughs> nice drink on the beach. <laughs> but he's down there and is uh, becoming a, an ambassador uh, and is currently in, involved with some of the many, like St. Louis, St. St. Lucia and uh, some of the other, other uh, spots down in the Caribbean. But I thought that it was interesting that Chinooks have always been ambassadors. Um, and I, I, my family was well educated. This is a letter that was uh, from Amal Petit. And this was in 1853, and it's three pages of familial guilt as to why their children haven't written to them sooner. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the, and all the gossip of the, of the area at St. David. But I think what's funny is that the letter was written on April 3rd, and they finally reached them on May 28th. And my cousin was just in Europe and sent me a postcard from Rome. And it took almost that long to get to Ocean Park. <laughs> it's like nothing has really changed. <laughs> So um, there are lots of things that my family has written on Chinooks and so forth, but I guess that's about it. Let's <laughs> try to talk down. <laughs>
And uh, we got there and there was nobody around. But it happened to be, it was fishing season and the Indians left. I mean, it was fishing season. But the young fellow there was very knowledgeable of what he knew. And he said, oh, he said, Chinook. He said, yeah. The old people that spoke jargon died out in around 1980s. What had happened is that Chinook jargon was the language, trade language, for all of BC. Mm -hmm. And then when they built the Alcan Highway, then they had English to become their language. Mm -hmm. And so the jargon died out. But I was really surprised. And also, I, as I remember, the uh, name for Greenhorn in Alaska is also a Chinook jargon. Mm -hmm. So we were all up and down the coast as far as language. But I thought I was trying to stay away from genealogy as much as I could from what Sidney said. Because, as I said, we'd get off on a dozen different directions. But my grandmother was born at Bruceport in 1891. And uh, her great-grandmother was at Wahootsin, which is the name of the tribe, or the town at Bruceport before the town of Brewsport. That was the village from Wahoots and the fire out. And this, that's what the car is up here. And the thing is that the, the fire owl was supposed to have shot an arrow, hit a lot ledge, and started a fire. And this where the deep fire came from. That's how the Indians learned how to make fire. So that's that's where it comes from on that. Uh, my great grandmother was great her great grandmother was Celestial. She, she was Chinook. She married a uh, lower Chehalis, whose name was Colquist, and they moved up to Oihut. And at the time, Oihut was the end of land. There wasn't anything where that beach is down below there that they built the, the resort on. They would get in and it. And then they came back to then the, the great grandmother was her great grandmother was Maria was born there and then they came back to Wahoosin and then they were there when the ship burnt and Bruce Port started and uh, my aunt always said that one of my relatives one of the relatives was uh, on the ship but we also found that he was in New York came into New York about the same time as the <laughs> ship burnt so obviously and then he was as far as we can tell, was hired to come out to work the oysters. And then uh, that's where he met and got and that's where he met my you know, try to keep my great 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 grandmother, <laughs> great grandmother. And uh, uh, then Maria had two daughters and Carolyn and Kate. And Carolyn made married uh, there and uh, I'm going blank on names. Must be old age. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, they married and uh, yeah, Carolyn married and then uh, McBride. Huh? Joe McBride. Joe McBride. Joe McBride. But we got a list of fact that my wife and her sister are great on genealogy. It's a good thing she looks up things. You've got more than I do. I just she's. She's the one. But we do have a, a, a list of the uh, militia that was out here. And uh, one of the other militia people was Swan. That was, so they were knew each other. And uh, the other thing is... But, 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 correct. Mill knew. Mil that's right. Mill knew Swan. Knew, knew Swan. He was 1855 in, in the militia. The militia, yeah. It was Mill that came over for the oysters and then the other... You know, somebody said the Scottish got along well with the names. I said, yeah, my name was McBride. But anyway, the, the Scotch intermarried a lot over here. So, uh, and then uh, we had, I'm trying my glasses and my notes here. Uh, so Sydney was talking about what happened over here. Uh, one thing was travel. And it was interesting because you could go across from Bruceport 
to tow them. And then they would walk up the beach, or they would usually not take a tender up the ocean, walk up the beach. You would go up to the next point, Westport, and then get a canoe and go across to Whitehead. Well, the thing is, 